Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Our verse for call to worship this morning is 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through the beginning of verse 13. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Let's stand together. Let's sing together. It's number two in your hymn book if you'd like it. Come, Christians, join to sing. <clears throat> verses 13 and 14 of the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, and uh, we're going to skip by it, if you'll forgive us such a terrible thing, and read verses 10 through 12 and verses 15 through 18. If you follow as I read 1 Corinthians 16, beginning at verse 10. Now if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid, for he is doing the Lord's work as I also am, so that no one despise him, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me. For I expect him with the brethren. But concerning Apollos, our brother, I encourage him greatly, encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren, and it was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. Beginning at verse 15, Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. I thank the Lord for his word this morning. As we continue in song, it's number 483 in your book, if you like. 483, Like a River Glorious.
I was really hoping this box up, up, up here wasn't a short joke for the pastor. So good. That's a wonderful boast, isn't it? Jesus died in my place. Children are dismissed to junior church at this time. And if the rest of you would join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I did that box thing to myself once. I taught under Pastor Jack Keep in Dale City, Virginia. Pastor Keep's probably 6'4". And um, I knew him when I was a teenager in Lock Haven, PA. He was the state rep for our fellowship. And uh, kids used to pick on me about my pointy-toed cowboy boots. 
And he told me as a man who wore pointed toe cowboy boots to tell people that was for stomping out cockroaches in corners. Um, Pastor Keep and I did not wear cowboy boots for the same purpose. He was 6'4". He wore them because he liked cowboy boots. I was 5'8 and wanted to look 5'10". That's why I wore them. You know? I still wouldn't look Christopher in the eye, but hey, I'd be at least to his nose. Uh, but anyway, um, when Pastor Keep asked me to start teaching his adult Sunday school class, I was honored. And the first day I stood on the box from the, that the little boys used at the water fountain so that people's you know, eyes wouldn't have too much shock. They were still looking up at the same place. But anyway, um, a couple of quick updates and prayer requests from our travels. Um, Pastor Tim Lewis and Andy at uh, New England Shores Baptist Church in Hampton, New Hampshire, uh, put together this camp meeting slash retreat. Uh, Pastor Tom Enman, a good friend of mine who's preached here before for us, covered when my uncle passed a couple of falls ago. Uh, Tom's been out of ministry, full-time ministry, for probably five years or so. Uh, he got um, uh, Lyme's disease, and then he, he ended up also getting a terrible mold allergy on top, which was only recently diagnosed. And uh, he it just, it, it, it really took his legs out from under him. And uh, Tom's an amazing guy. You've heard him preach. He's a tremendous carpenter. Uh, had to work on the side to support himself and his little church in, in Vermont. And uh, he's been out of ministry. And they went down for a year down to the Carolinas, lived in an RV, uh, a new RV, so as to get away from the mold. He's feeling better. And uh, when we saw him at the, confer at the camp meeting the Saturday night, uh, he was going to be at a church in the Lakes region, not far from Michalina, uh, in the next morning. He may go up there to help them plan a daughter church. So if you think about it, pray for our dear friends Tom and Lynn Enman. Uh, another friend who's covered pulpit here for me, Scott Van Dyne, went home to the Lord in November last year. Uh, we had a great deal of time with his son and daughter and uh, his little granddaughter, uh, his wife and son-in-law. And it's good to see them serving the Lord and God picking up their pieces for them. Uh, but pray for the Van Dyne family. And then... Uh, Allegheny Baptist Church, Allegheny, New York, was my home away from home for nearly 30 years as my dad pastored out there. Uh, it was a thriving church, and because of the economy, because of COVID, because of funerals, they're a fraction of what they used to be, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, they have a new pastor and wife, uh, Pastor Mark Chapman and his wife Angie, that looks like they're in very good hands out there. So pray for Allegheny Baptist and for all of our sister churches. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult time. and. Um, we're glad to be home, and uh, truly glad to be home. It was great to get away, but it's great to get back. And uh, you notice my very, very clever and eloquent title. Paul talks about people. Isn't that profound? Paul talks about people. Uh, but that's about as profound as I could get. Uh, the gist is here is this. It, it's easy to treat the end of Paul's epistles as throwaway, throwaway material. Uh, he's, he's using names. He's talking to them about inside stuff. It's really their business, not mine. Well, understand that Paul is writing as, as a church planner to a church he planted. He's writing as a Christian friend to Christian friends younger in the Lord. He's writing to people he cares about. It's personal, and it sounds like Paul because it is Paul. But we know that Paul was not alone. The Holy Spirit bore him aloft as he wrote. The Holy Spirit superintended the writing of Scripture so that these men could use their own talent, ability, personality, and it was still the very word of God. God wants us to know all these Greek names here, Stephanus and Achaicus and all of these. Um, there's a reason that the end of chapter 16 is here in our Bible. And so we, we don't dare treat it as flyover country and just wave as we go by. Uh, we need to look at it a minute. I also think there's quite a message here about honoring those in our midst who serve the Lord and serve Him with faithfulness. And absolutely not just the pastor or the pastor and wife, but everybody that serves the Lord. Uh, remember the tone and purpose of Paul's letter to Corinth, his first letter here. He is writing in response to a letter that they gave him. Six times in this letter, he writes the words, and or but concerning, or now concerning. And all of those, it very much appears he's answering their questions. He's addressing things that they brought up in their letter. And there's three men that he names for us at the end of this passage that are most likely the couriers who came across the Aegean Sea from Corinth to Ephesus to deliver this letter to Paul. 
So Paul is writing to answer their questions, and a lot of what he talks about has a lot to do with what he has heard of them and especially with what they've said to him or asked of him. Paul was quite direct. You could even use the word pointed. There are places where he takes the gloves off. There are places where he pivots the gun barrel so the muzzle is pointing directly at the Corinthians. He says to them, chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto fleshly, because you're living like unsaved people, is what he's telling them. So the first three chapters, he's talking about what could be other people, other places, and, and you could see the Corinthians on the sideline. That's it. Give them both barrels, Paul. Let them have it. And then bzz, the muzzles turn, you know, the turrets on the gunship turn, and the Corinthians find themselves looking down the barrels personally. I couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual, as unto spiritually minded people, but as unto carnal, fleshly minded people. And so he's kind of taking the gloves off several places in this letter. He's pretty direct. He felt the need to defend himself personally and especially his role as an apostle because it was questioned. Part of that had to do with Apollos. Paul was an apostle. He says elsewhere he was an apostle because he was their apostle. Jesus called him personally and he sent them to the Corinthians and they were the proof of his apostleship. God had created a church where there wasn't one using a man like Paul and Paul gives the Lord the glory for it as he ought to. And in behind Paul came Apollos. Now as a rather short and stumpy kind of individual, here's what I think Apollos looked like. I think Apollos was probably about six foot four. I think he had a rugged, chiseled jaw and muscular, good-looking features with piercing eyes. And I think that Apollos probably had one of those preacher voices that's down deep and resonates and just grabs you. Maybe, maybe he had a little Alistair Begg in him and he had that wonderful Scottish accent to boot. Some men are just really, really good at this and really look good doing it and command a room, don't they? Praise the Lord, you don't have to be one of them to be a pastor. And read the beginning of 1 Corinthians where God says, Paul says, God chooses the weak to confound the mighty and the foolish to confound the wise and the, the just nobodies to impress the people who think they are somebody. Uh, God wants to get all the credit. And so when you realize that that's what he's doing in you, it, it takes pride and throws it out. Uh, he's not using me because I'm special. He's using me because I'm so poor I make him look good. Uh, that's how he uses us. It's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, but the people were enamored with Apollos. Apollos probably did have a commanding presence. Apollos was a great orator. He could turn a phrase. He could speak cleverly, keep people right with him. Uh, and so people, after hearing Apollos, and Paul, remember, Paul was, I think Paul checked his guns at the door. Forgive me that, that, that reference, but I think Paul kind of kept one hand behind his back as far as his talent for oratory. Paul's sermon in Mars Hill in Acts 17 is held up as an example sermon to, to students of how to preach, even today, almost 2,000 years later. I mean, it was clever. He showed how smart he was. He got people focused on the right thing. He had a fantastic introduction. It was amazing. But what did he say to the Corinthians? When I was with you, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, I, I got to tell you, there was so little response and God's spirit worked in me. And, and after Mars Hill, man, I had to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. I had to be simple and straightforward. And if I'm clever and people get nothing, that's worth nothing. And so less of me and more of him. Less of everything else and more of the cross. And he put the cross in front of them. Jesus, the Son of God, died for you and rose again. Over and over, plain and simple and direct, Jesus, the Son of God, died for you to pay for your sin. And all you must do is believe in what he did for you. And so Paul was very simple and straightforward. But then they heard Apollos. And man, that guy could speak. And they thought, you know, Paul, some of them, not all of them, a number of them really received Paul well and they got it, but a number of them are like, Paul, who's he? He's not impressive to look at. He's not impressive to, look at, to listen to. Man, he's got nothing on Apollos. Apollos is amazing. And so this is going to come back. 
Uh, Paul had to defend himself in his apostleship from time to time. We need to, again, be careful. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Pastor, I've never heard you preach on Leviticus. Okay, but someday you will. If the Lord tarries, if he lets me live long enough, we'll get there. Uh, but if there's a purpose. Genesis 5. So-and-so lived so many years and he begat so-and-so and then he lived so many other years and he begat more sons and daughters and, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. I mean, it's there for a purpose. And when we go back and we try to get timelines and figure things out and, and see God's pattern, there's amazing things in those genealogies in Genesis chapter 5. When we get to the genealogy of Christ, that makes more sense because we have Genesis chapter 5 to look at and to weave together. All scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Again, the Holy Spirit put it there for a reason. Uh, he mentions people by name. We have to, as public speakers, be very, very careful who we mention and how we mention them. There are certain things that I might say to a group of people that I will not say in front of a camera. Whether at a conference or in church, there's some times where you, you've got to be more careful because there could be that you could say something namelessly and you're half a country away and nobody here is ever going to have any clue the situation you're talking about. But if somebody gets, you know, man, I get in trouble on YouTube. I made a statement about my basketball prowess, you know, shooting hoops with a buddy in college and he called me that night to say, I think you overplayed that a little. Uh, I used my dad as an illustration and one of his church ladies during the days of the quarantine he wasn't online so he told his people to look me up and I talked about my dad in the morning and he called me that afternoon to say what's the big idea using me for a sermon illustration incidentally I can use him a hundred times a week for the rest of my life and not be even if you understand what I'm saying I was his long before he was mine uh, but again sometimes Paul used names usually predominantly when he used a name, he was very positive. Sometimes he wasn't. Sometimes it was a warning. I give you there Second Timothy 4.14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. In other words, you need to watch out for this person. He is an enemy of the Christ you're preaching. Therefore, he's going to make himself yours. Don't turn your back on him. You keep your eye out for him. And he mentioned him by name. Uh, it's really we've got to be extraordinarily careful when we talk to one person about another especially if we're talking about someone by name etc Paul does that here and I think again we'll see the purpose it's very very pleasant in this place let's have a word of prayer as we dig into the meat of this Father thank you for a beautiful day oh it's gorgeous outside with all the leaves turning it's so good to be home to be here Lord with our own church family I pray Lord that you would open our hearts to your word Help us to see even in these closing statements what wonderful meat is on the bones here. There's so much for us. And I pray, Lord, that we might uh, chew on it, savor it, learn from it, and uh, take from here, Lord, what you have for us. We thank you for it. We pray your blessing and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. So the people that Paul talks about, uh, first of all, he talks about Timothy. He says, verse 10, Now if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. Now, I don't have a map up. I probably should have. Remember that uh, there is Corinth and there is Ephesus. These are major towns in the Roman Empire, major cities. They are directly across the Aegean Sea from each other, going east to west. If you have enough money for a boat ride, it's not that far at all between them. But it's expensive. It's rough seas that are not easily traveled in winter. And so very often, especially if you had money like Paul and Timothy probably did, you had to go up through the rest of Turkey above Ephesus and come across by land a longer way down through Macedonia. Uh, basically, you're coming down through Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and so forth like Paul did on his journey. And so what it appears is that, the Lord, that Paul was able to send the letter by way of the couriers that he's going to mention here in a moment straight back across the Aegean, and so the letter got there way before Timothy, who had to go the long way by land. It's a little bit of a, of a puzzlement to me and to others why the word if is here, if he's here. He sent him. He's on his way. 
if he's there. Uh, perhaps that was the nature of you know, the proviso for the dangerous world in which they lived and the, the route that he was trekking and all the things that could have happened to him. That could be. Uh, but he, he's really just speaking. He gives it a condition, but he gets right to it. See to it that he's with you without cause to be afraid. I think about who Timothy was to Paul. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 19, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his, Timothy's, proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. In other words, Paul says, Paul is like my, uh, Timothy's like my son in the faith. He's my faithful fellow servant. He and I are, are like-minded. Uh, here, New American Standard says we're of kindred spirit. I think it's the nature of, of a really good, you know, there are mentors and protégés, and then there are mentors and protégés. Some men just really click in a beautiful way. Some people in the student-teacher relationship it's particularly beautiful, and the protege has exactly the right mentor, and the mentor has exactly the right protege, and God does an amazing thing. That was Paul and Timothy. Paul knew that Timothy had the same mind. That's the literal of it here. They were of the same mind. Timothy's reactions will be like mine. His responses will be like mine because I've, I've, done, a, you know, I, I've done a data dump from my hard drive to his. I've, I've spent a lot of my ministry discipling him, teaching him everything I know, giving him what God's given me and passing it along. And so Paul thought the world in all of Timothy and he trusted him. And so Paul was Timothy, or Timothy was Paul's most trusted confidant. The, the passage here in Philippians I just read, that's later in Paul's ministry. It's a prison epistle. Uh, that's, he, he speaks in other prison epistles. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Again, he uses a name. So take note, it's rare that he does a thing like that, and it had a purpose, but the world tugged him away. This passage, all don't, you know, seek their own things and not the things of the Lord, but not Timothy. He was to me like a son to his father. Uh, and so he says, see to it that he's with you without cause for fear. Remember, the Corinthians knew him. He was there when Paul planted the church. Paul was there about a year and a half. Uh, Acts chapter 18 tells us all about that. Timothy was there. They knew him. Uh, why Paul was concerned that they receive him well? I think Paul understood that there were people there who had doubts about him, Paul. There were people there that had issues with him, uh, that were being unkind to him, that weren't really accepting him and his authority and his position in God's program. And they saw Timothy as just kind of Paul Jr., which he kind of was. And so he says, see to it that he doesn't have to be afraid. Remember, Paul has spoken to Timothy other times, and, and he's, he's really kind of had to pump Timothy up a little bit, brace him up and encourage him not to be afraid, encourage him to be bold. Let no man despise your youthfulness. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, he tells him in 1 Timothy 4.12. Um, forgive me, I couldn't remember if I left it in here. 1 Timothy 4.12, let no man despise your, youth, your youthfulness, but be an example of the believer. Incidentally, there's a couple things here. There is a debate about exactly how young Timothy was. Understand, in their day, even Jesus himself was a great example. Uh, the rabbi did not begin his ministry until he was 30. That was how things were. They, they weren't considered ready for prime time until they were 30. And our world isn't completely like that, but in some ways it is. Uh, most folks can get pretty good jobs in their 20s, uh, but people really start to hit their stride when they get in their 30s, don't they? And we finally start to figure things out in our 50s when we start breaking down. And so we're not much good for very long, but there's a brief little spot where we're, all, we're almost worth having around. Timothy, Paul tells him, don't let anybody despise or look down on your youthfulness. Timothy could have been 40. He was relatively young. He wasn't tremendously long, young necessarily, but relatively young. My first church, every one of my four deacons was 72 and I took that church when I was, thir or was 70, I took that church when I was 34. One of those deacons, Ed Lehman and I, shared a birthday, July 30th. 
So I went to Ed one day. He says, happy birthday, Pastor. Love you. Man, I melted when that man said that to me. It meant the world to me. I says, happy birthday, Brother Ed. I says, hey, Brother Ed, I did the math. At this moment in time, I'm exactly half your age, my 36 to your 72. He says, I figured it out too, Pastor. And you know what? It'll never happen again. I love that. He was perfect right there with it. Uh, but you know what? I could have been in that church until I was 100, and I would have been a young man. Certainly until I had the last, you know, some of these, you ever know people, I've known folks that were in their 70s, their parents had, were doing well in their 90s, and they still got treated like little kids. You know, it, it can happen, but there's young and there's relatively young. Uh, a lady in my dad's church, one of the, the losses that's, that's the most strongly felt is June Potter. Uh, June lived, I think, 94 years old. Uh, she's been here before. I don't know if any of you would remember her. Uh, she and another ladies from that church went to uh, Judy's uncles, or uncles, aunts over in Auburn and stayed with them. And Judy's aunts treated Mrs. Potter, who was in her later 70s at the time, they treated her like she was a teenage girl. She hadn't turned her light out at 1030, and they gently knocked at the door and said, young women, young godly women should not be up after this hour. And they were, they were chaperoning the church's youth group that my dad had brought up here to help the Kinneys. And uh, they came in after 10 o'clock one night, and they got a lecture. And I apologized to Mrs. Potter, and she brightened up. She says, not at all. She says, I haven't felt this young in years. So age is relative, you know. It's just relative. Uh, but Paul was young. And so Paul, or Timothy, was young. I've done that twice. Timothy was young, and Paul said to him, don't let people look down on you or blow you off because you're young. It doesn't matter that you're young. It matters that you are exemplary. One of my mentors in college gave me a pencil when I graduated with one of her favorite sayings on it. Be someone impressive to imitate. That was what she taught the teachers. Be someone impressive to imitate. What does Paul say? Follow me as I follow Christ. What a bold thing to say. If you're going to say it, you better follow Christ carefully. Um, Paul was that. And so don't let, Tim, Timothy, don't let them look down on you. Be exemplary. Um, his instructions. Don't cause him fear or anxiety. Don't, don't give him any reason to be afraid. Uh, Timothy, again, was young, and he seems to have had some anxieties and to have been timid. We see other passages where Paul's kind of propping him up, encouraging him to stand true, and uh, he needed a little of that, and so he's saying, you treat him well. And I think part of his concern was who Timothy was, how old he was, etc., but a lot of it was Timothy represented Paul's thinking and teaching, and there were people there who did not like Paul's teaching and did not like his thinking. And so Timothy would be in the crosshairs. He says, treat him as God's co-laborer, co co Paul's co-laborer. Don't despise him. I've told you many times, we think of the word despise as a, a deeper, more hostile form of hatred. I hate you, I loathe you, I despise you, Bugs Bunny said once. Uh, despise literally means to, make no, to give no thought to. To not think of it all, to blow off, to ignore, just to despise. Bah, I don't care. What's he mean to me? He's just some kid. And so he says, don't despise him. Don't blow him off because of who he is. He actually encouraged them to uh, help Timothy on his way. Send him to me. Uh, the wording there is sponsor him to me. Help him on his way to me. Um, so he talked about Timothy and how he was to be received. Verse 12. But concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren. And it was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. Now about, or but concerning. This is the same Greek word. This is the sixth time it's used in the book. It's always other, every other place that refers to their letter, very often to their questions. Apparently, they said, could we have Apollos back? Apollos, ironically, or, or happen, as it happens, is ministering with Paul in Ephesus, just across the Aegean. Could we have Apollos back? Could he come for at least a little while and minister to us and among us? And so Paul went to him, and notice, to Paul's credit, even though there were people that were holding up Apollos and saying, this is what an apostle's supposed to look like, and Paul, you're nothing. In spite of that, Paul said to Apollos, I'd love it if you went. He says, notice here, I encouraged him greatly. By the way, Paul did not command him. Paul was not Apollos' boss. That was not the dynamic. They were co-laborers. 
And so with someone who is your peer, who is your core laborer, you encourage them, you make suggestions to them, but you let them make their decision. They're autonomous from you, and that's what was going on here. I think it says so much about both men here. Even though they were holding Apollos up versus Paul, Paul wanted Apollos to go. He thought that would be healthy, that might, that might heal this thing a little bit. And so he didn't want to hide them. I joke about never having a guest speaker who's better than me. I, I used to joke about a certain pastor I had, notice I'm not using names this time, uh, who every time he left, he, he brought in nice men, good men, but they had nowhere near the skill in the pulpit that he did. And I always joked, just with my wife, that he did that so he looked good. Uh, I came here, I, I had a particularly rough couple of years, and I took three Sundays in a row off, after which Herb said, please don't do that again. Uh, but the good part of that was Charlie Bordenero and Donna had just retired the first time, and uh, they've unretired and haven't retired again. They're in their second ministry after that. Uh, but Charlie came here and preached, and let me t I joked that I broke the rule because that man can bring it in the pulpit. He's fantastic, and the Lord has used him so many places in so many ways. Uh, it's pretty awesome, but I really joke about that. I don't do anything like that on purpose. And uh, to be honest, in New England, if I can find an, a, a trustworthy pe person, man to cover the pulpit, that's what I'm after, and that's hard enough to find. So uh, if that trustworthy person is much better than me in the pulpit, well, you'll just have to get used to me when I come back. Uh, that's how that goes. But he wanted Apollos to go, and Apollos didn't want to go. And I think that says something about both of them there. Uh, the Corinthian believers were factious. They were split up. For, chapter 1 tells us about it. Chloe's people have told me, um, oh, forgive me, I'm doing this way too many times. Uh, Chloe's people had told them that, uh, that there were factions, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Christ. And Paul goes into a discussion, how dare you say any of that? The gist is we're all of Christ, that's what this is about. And so Paul's very clear about it. Paul has used in chapter 3, he's used himself and Apollos as an example. Now realize he and Apollos are in the same town. It's completely possible they actually talk to each other in the course of Paul writing this letter. It's absolutely likely that they spent time with each other and they had tremendous confidence in each other and in their relationship. Paul was not threatened by Apollos. Apollos was not threatened by Paul. These two men loved each other and they saw themselves as um, really, I think, complementary pieces in what God was doing. Uh, our church has very little experience with changing pastors. We're 52 years old this year, uh, 52 and a half about, and I'm the second guy. I've been here 16 years, the first one here 36 years. So this church hasn't learned the lessons about how God brings different men at different times. Uh, they just, you know, had to come from Pastor Branham to me, and they've, they've, they figured me out, and they've been patient with me. But I've watched it in church after church after church, God brings a different type of man who complements and fills in what was missing with the guy before him. It's been amazing. First Baptist, North Conway. Dear friends, dear friends in the church, friends with pastors old and new. Pastor Kinney went there straight out of school. They paid him, I think, $160 a week. He had to go to, right back to work swinging a hammer, and he did. And... The Lord blessed him, and that church came back. They were down to 11 members when he went there. Pastor Kenny, if you know him, he has enough energy. He's older than me. He still has enough energy for three people. That's how he's wired. I used to wear myself out trying to be him until I realized God just wanted me to be the best me I could be and not to be Roy. But Pastor Kenny was exactly the right man to go and to recover that church before it disappeared. What a church. If you travel in North Conway, if you're, if you're looking at the big yellow scenic railroad building, turn around and look straight ahead and you're looking right at First Baptist North Conway. There's a Paul Revere Bell in the Belfry. The church is built in the 1840s. It was founded in 1796. What a place. And the Lord used Pastor Roy Kenny and Karen to bring that church back from the brink. Exactly the right man. And then for 11 months they had to put up with an intern who was very, very wet behind the ears. And, and just help them get from one point to the other. But in the 26 years since then, they've had Pastor Lawrence Brown. Pastor, 
Kenny is a very good teacher. Pastor Brown is exceptional. He's the kind of teacher that we teachers go to to get taught. And Pastor Brown has been feeding that church, and that church has been punching above its weight class for 26 years and accomplishing things that little churches that size just shouldn't be able to accomplish. They've done amazing things because God brought the right man. Time and again, God brings in men that are complementary to the man before them or the man after them. We, can't, we don't all have all the tools all the time, and God does that amazingly. And Paul and Apollos realize that in each other. And then here, notice uh, on the wall, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 9, what then is Paul, and, or what is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So notice he doesn't say who is Paul and who is Apollos. He says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? We're just servants. We're playing our part. We're doing our duty. We're doing our job. I planted. That was my privilege and my responsibility. I planted the seed in the ground. Apollos came with that big tall watering can and he watered. But you know what? I didn't make the seed germinate. I didn't make the seed grow. Apollos didn't make it germinate. Apollos didn't make it grow. God did. One of my mom's favorite junior church songs, Oh, who can make a flower? I'm sure I can't, can you? Oh, who can make a flower? No one but God. It's true. We see the seed germinate. We see the roots go down and the stalk come up. But how it happens is God. And that it happens is God. And we've learned it needs water. We've learned it needs the sun. But it's God that makes it grow. And it's like that with Christ's church, is it not? And so it gives, us a perp it gives us a proper perspective. We're just God's tools in his, in his tool shed. We're God's servants, his ministers, and he's the one who does the growth. And therefore, he's the one that deserves all the glory that's due his name. Um, it was Apollos' choice not to come. Paul encouraged him to. Um, <clears throat> The house of Stephanus, verse 15. We preached verses 13 and 14, uh, and he talked about the doors that were open him, and he talked about, you know, uh, earlier, and then he talked in 13 and 14 about um, to behave like men, to stand firm. And uh, we've, we've preached that, and, and we've kind of put the personal stuff, the, the names, either side of it, together. Uh, I don't very often go out of order, but did here. Verse 15, now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. That you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. Uh, our Thessalonians passage for call to worship, uh, that's not just for pastors, that's for others who labor among you, who feed you the word, and who have positions of authority among you and over you. Honor them for who they are and what they do. Honor them for how they let God use them. And here, he puts up Stephanus. I mean, there are people in our fellowship that know people in my church by name. Most of the pastors in this fellowship could name my deacons at least by first name. And if they can't, they'll say things like the candy man or the young one with the beard. Uh, those are the kind of things. Uh, or the guy in the closet. Uh, that would be Steve. Uh, but uh, anyway... Uh, that's our fellowship is relatively small but people know our people and they, they see them they recognize them and they, they see how the Lord uses them and, and they're grateful I love our fellowship I love our uh, conferences where it's not just the pastors and wives that get the fellowship but all of our people if they want it uh, we delight in that and we could put names up like Stephanus many places there are people that do a work uh, it was nice at the camp meeting to meet uh, folks from my brother's church, my brother in Christ's church, uh, Tim's church. People, some of them I'd met here and there at other functions. Some of them I'd heard their name a lot. But to get to know them was an absolute delight. To get to see people and see at work 
the things that he's told me about. We glory in such things, to see God using people. And so Paul holds them up. Uh, back in chapter 1, when they're, Paul says, listen, I didn't baptize anybody, but, and he gives a short list, and then he had an oh yeah moment. Oh yeah, and by the way, the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I can't think of anybody else I baptized. So I call them the oh yeahs here. Uh, they were Paul's oh yeahs from uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, he saw them as the first fruits of their region, some of the first to trust Christ and to really serve the Lord. It's amazing how often God used the first folks saved. Uh, Lydia in Philippi uh, housed Paul and company every time they traveled through Philippi. They had a place to stay. She took care of them uh, and looked out for them. Be, you know, the Lord had opened her heart to believe, and she had wherewithal to take care of them. It was a beautiful thing. That was kind of how it was with Stephanus and with this whole family. They had devoted themselves to ministry for the saints. They sacrificially served, and people knew them as folks that sacrificially served. And so what Paul is saying is you know them, hold them in high regard, and notice here his, his command is be subject to them. Put yourself below them. If they ask you to do a thing, do it. If they give you correction, take it. Subject yourself to them. It's interesting wording. Uh, he says, honor them for their work and devotion. Subject yourselves to them. Um, again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13 is not just pastors. And then he talks about the men that likely have brought the letters back and forth. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part. He didn't say you shorted me and they filled in the blanks. Um, it, it, he just said they, they he's saying they represented you well when they came here. I needed to hear from you. I needed to know how you were. I couldn't come to you. I've already told you I want to come to you as soon as I can, but I couldn't. And so I needed to hear from them, same as I need you to hear from t me through Timothy. I needed to hear from these men. And he says, I rejoice that they came. They've supplied what was lacking. They have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, notice the big thing he asks, acknowledge them. When I was a kid, I moved from the dinky town of Boonville, Indiana, um, where I had one friend whose mom was Bolivian and everybody else was Caucasian in my whole town that I could think of. I moved to a suburb of Oakland, California, my dad was going to school in San Francisco. By the time I was in seventh grade, I think there were three Caucasian kids in my class. I know what it is to be a minority. Frankly, it was pretty awesome. Our church was fantastic. We had a carry-in dinner. It was always an international dinner, even though it didn't advertise that way, and the food was fantastic. Uh, I, I learned a lot of lessons as a little kid out there in California. One of the things I learned in walking the streets of a town that's so dangerous that the two high schools in San Leandro aren't allowed to play each other in sports anymore because their rivalry and their pranks got bloody and, and dangerous, life-threatening. And so they weren't allowed to play each other when I was leaving there. So I was taught certain things. One of the things is when you see somebody, don't stare them down. Another guy's walking towards you, maybe he looks a little rugged. Whatever you do, don't stare him down. But also don't turn your head and ignore him acknowledge and keep walking. What's the acknowledgement? Do you see that? A little head bob, that's all. I see you. Uh, acknowledgement. Somebody's flagging traffic. In mass, it has to be a policeman. That's because we don't like to save our money, we like to spend it. Uh, but they're flagging traffic. They're sending you by whatever's getting done in the road. A nod, a wave, just a simple little thank you. Very often, I don't know their name, they don't know mine. In my town, you know, some of them, uh, they've been pretty busy. I ought to know their name by now. They're, they're standing in the middle of the street every day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is just acknowledging people. There are people in our midst who serve. Amen? We have a lot of servants. We don't have a whole lot of servants, you know. It's STP is either the same 10 people or the same 20 people in most churches of our size. Uh, but the fact is we have a lot of people who sacrificially give so that the church can function. Do you appreciate them? And do they know that you appreciate them? Do you acknowledge them? Do you thank them? You've, you've spoiled us since we've been here. I know you're not going to do anything this year. Hector told me. Not really. But you, you've spoiled me in October of, of every year I've been here. You've been very, very good to me. Please be good to each other and thank each other. Do you appreciate it? Let me ask you, 
I heard about Worthy as the Lamb the first week I was gone. Do you appreciate our piano players? Maybe even a little more than you used to? I hope you appreciate Steve, our audio video guy who cut that out of the video before it went to YouTube. Uh, but, uh, you know, I appreciate Jason, who's not musical by nature and who was willing to come up here and lead the singing without a piano. That was a big deal. Uh, that's very out of his, that's more out of his comfort zone than preaching is. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, do you appreciate the people who watch the kids? Do you appreciate the people who keep things clean? Do you appreciate the people who things, keep things in good repair? Do you appreciate the people who take care of our finances? Do you know how much work there is to treasure and auditor in this place? There's a boatload. As churches go, the, 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 the most work done by unpaid staff is almost always the financials. And uh, it's a lot to ask from people. We have people that do such a fantastic job teaching our kids downstairs. We have people that come out of the woodwork and serve in VBS. My point and Paul's point is take note of those people. Paul says, note the ones that are following Christ and follow them, he says elsewhere. Here he says, take note of those who are serving, acknowledge them. Serve with them, but acknowledge them. Just let them know, thank you. We appreciate you. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're giving to the Lord. We're glad you're giving to the Lord in a way that benefits us. Show your appreciation. Take a moment, just a little bit of, give just a little bit of attention and effort to acknowledging the servants in our church. Those who teach, who clean, repair, play an instrument, watch the children, account for the money, preserve the re records, who plan and organize, and the list goes on and on. That's one of the dangerous things of thanking people from up here, is I will always forget somebody or some area. So pro I'm sure in my list there, that's why I put and so forth. Please forgive me. Uh, but we love how people serve. And being away and being in other churches and coming back to Pilgrim and its flavor and Pilgrim and his servants is a delight. Acknowledge one another and thank one another. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Uh, help us to live it in the week to come to honor and glorify you in it. Thank you, Lord, for those that gave us the word of God. Thank you for those who led us to the cross of Christ and to salvation. Uh, help us, Lord, to emulate them and to share him frequently and often with others, Lord, uh, to be prepared at any time to give our testimony, to be prepared at any time to share the gospel message. Uh, help us, Lord, to live a life of gratitude to you and help us to acknowledge and show our gratitude uh, to the servants in our midst. We're so grateful for them. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would just guide us and use us in the week to come. In Christ's name, amen. As we close higher ground, Let's just sing the first and the last, verse 1 and the last verse of Higher Ground. Let's stand together as we sing.
he was able to have some time to himself in the last few weeks. And at the end of the discussion, that he was on home safe and so on. Lord, we ask that you be with us this coming week as we go about our business. Lord, that we might acknowledge you to others and your word, Lord. We ask our blessing for the rest of this day and look forward to tonight's community.